your you, oops we need to admit someone else can you okay okay now it's recording mm -hmm. okay so if you could uh set your viewing options to the speaker view you so you'll be able to see the person speaking while we're sharing slides And I'm from the Georgia Cancer Center, and I'm part of our hub team of the uh, Teladerm project. Dr. Doug Patton and I will be serving as co-facilitators of the TeleEcho session today. So that we can get to know each other, if you could indicate in the chat your full name, the name of your clinic, and your email address. And you should be able to see um, an example in the chat already. So let me review today's agenda with you. Next slide. So we will begin with introductions, followed by a didactic presentation by Dr. Rabinovitz. Then we'll have a case presentation um, by Dr. Kendall Buchanan. There'll be questions and case discussion, and then we'll have a wrap up uh, with an announcement. So I would like to introduce Dr. Jorge Cortez, director of the Georgia Cancer Center um, and principal investigator on the grant. If you'd like to say a couple words. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, everybody, for joining. As Ria mentioned, this is our first uh, uh, actual uh, session of this TeleEcho project. And the idea of this is to make it uh, very valuable for you. So we encourage you to provide us with feedback of uh, anything that you hear, any uh, suggestions that you may have for topics that you want to be presented. But most important, the whole concept of the teleecho is that the session is mostly the re, uh, deliver, uh, derived from, uh, from your contributions, your presentations, your questions, your discussion of the cases. We're here to facilitate that, uh, to, to help you answer the questions. Uh, but, but we want these to be useful for you and to really fulfill that uh, element of uh, uh, helping you uh, develop that confidence so that as we continue with these, the, the uh, helping with the cases as you submit them through the uh, teledermatology, but also through these sessions, uh, you increase your competence and your confidence on uh, evaluating these patients. So please provide us with your feedback. And, and again, we encourage you to be very active participants on these. You are the main, uh, the, the, the main educators on these, uh, on these sessions. And uh, we, we really want to hear from you and to have everybody involved, uh, everybody commenting, uh, presenting cases eventually and, uh, and discussing uh, throughout the conference. So thank you very much. Uh, we, have, we appreciate your interest in these sessions and we really hope that they're gonna be very useful for you. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. Now I'd like to introduce our program manager, Dr. Claudia Guillen. Would you like to say a few words? Hello, everyone. My name is Claudia Guillen. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm the program, uh, co the program manager for the Teleden project and also the ECHO coordinator for um, this TeleEcho Teleden session. Thank you, everyone, again, for being part of this ECHO session. I'd like to introduce two new members of the DERM team. So most of you know Dr. Jeremy Greer, who has been with us uh, from the beginning and a very valuable member of the DERM team. Well, he's leaving us this summer uh, to, for a new position in his home state of Tennessee. And so we will miss him, but we have two new dermatologists on board to take his place. First, we have Dr. Kendall Buchanan, and she is an assistant professor in the dermatology department, and she practices out of AU's Care Center for Dermatology in Aiken, South Carolina. We also have joining our team is Dr. Etsub Ajabo, who's a third year resident in the derm department. So these two physicians will be joining with Dr. Rabinovitz in reading your Moleskope in images and making diagnosis. So welcome aboard, Drs. Buchanan and Ajabo. Now we also uh, have here Dr. Kenza Mamouni. Hi everyone. And Dr. Mayor Saul Miranda Galvis. 
right? They're both here at the hub managing all the controls. So now I will introduce you to Dr. Doug Patton, who will take over today's session. Dr. Patton is the Dean of the Southwest Georgia Medical College of um, Georgia campus and has spent most of his career as a rural physician. Doug, take it away. Thank you very much, Rhea. This is an exciting day and it's been, uh, been a while in the planning and we're really thrilled to be able to have you with us today as we launch this project. We'll start uh, with a few uh, announcements and just a, sort of a recap. Um, the first thing we'll do is just a little bit about Project ECHO in general. So uh, as you can see, ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And it's intended, as Rhea pointed out, for this to be something that we all participate in and we all learn from. Next slide. It's a collaborative medical education model, again, that includes some didactics, but it also means that we're creating learning communities or learning loops, if you will, between the specialists and the frontline clinicians. We realize that you find yourselves, uh, especially in the community health care setting, uh, oftentimes um, uh, struggling a little bit to get the help that you need. And we feel if we can help you uh, more confidently assess and uh, then be able to manage more problems as your confidence and your confidence increases or to appropriately refer will also help you hopefully with connections for that as well. ECHO was developed at the University of New Mexico um, at, at the Health Sciences Center and it, it's clear, let's make it clear that in these sessions we will not be providing direct care for patients. In other words, this is not a consultation service. We have that available as part of the Moleskoe project but the ECHO itself is purely education. And of course, there's the link for Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico. Next slide, please. So uh, replication of the ECHO model is achieved through the creation of an ECHO center. And in this case, that's us. We're serving as the hub and the partner sites are the spokes, which is created through these tele-ECHO sessions. And you guys, of course, are the spokes. So um, let's see, next slide. Um, the goal of this project is to improve knowledge through telemedicine, which in this case, which is teledermoscopy and teledermatology at the local level, and to use distance learning approaches to help dissolve the health disparities that are faced by the people that you serve in rural areas across the state of Georgia. Next slide. So in these sessions, um, this will give you an opportunity to present and discuss your challenging cases, things that you've learned uh, along the way and based on your experience, how we can learn from you. This hopefully will also enhance your ability to extend specialty care to your patients, either through enhancement of your own knowledge and competence or by bringing us on board with our dermatology experts to assist providing the care for your patients where they are without having to refer them necessarily. Um, so that is the idea behind uh, reducing the need to refer patients outside your system, but providing the appropriate care right where they are, uh, reducing travel time, uh, days off from work, wait times and things like that that are normally part of the referral for specialty care. Next slide. A couple of things that we like to do during Telederm sessions, the Teleecho in general. Um, all Teleecho sessions, as Rhea mentioned, are recorded. That creates uh, a database for us to be able to go back and review, uh, and also for you to be able to review. Um, you are consenting to be recorded by virtue of your participation here, and we're grateful to have that participation. Um, we do not mention PHI in our discussions, and we ask that as you prepare materials for uh, presentation in the future that you're mindful of that so that any potential PHI will be uh, eliminated. That's normal in the course of a consultation, but remember, this is not a consultation for direct patient care. This is an educational situation. Um, we will have information in the chat uh, related to how to get uh, credit for CME as well as for CNE. And there's always, of course, the opportunity to email us further questions later at teledermatology at augusta.edu. Next slide. Um, 
Project ECHO does collect registration information. You're all here by virtue of your registration and we appreciate you taking that step to be here. The participation in the question and answers, chat comments and everything are recorded and kept. All this data is kept confidential, but it may be used for the collection of information related to reports on participation and our assessment of whether or not the whole initiative is proving to be effective and of value to the participants. Uh, Zoom rules, last slide, I think for me, um, is to remember to keep yourself muted when you're not speaking and to unmute yourself when we do speak. We're, we've been doing this for a while now, but it's still uh, occasionally all of us forget to unmute when we speak. So be mindful of that. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions, uh, enter those into the chat. Um, if you need to ask for clarification in the middle of the presentation, um, we will try and be mindful of that. But if you do that, you go to the reactions button on the bottom of your screen, you click on that, and you'll have one of the options will be to raise your hand. <clears throat> if we call on you, uh, we'll be able to see who's raised their hands. If we call on you, then please just introduce yourself after you unmute uh, and ask your question and we'll try and add those. Remember, we're gonna have time at the end for question and answer. Um, as you participate, we also want your camera to remain on so that we can see the faces of those who are uh, participating. And that's, we, we would like for you to keep it on all the time. Um, if you need to adjust your lighting, obviously that's something that we've also become a little bit more uh, familiar with and the use of the gallery view allows you to see all participants during the meeting, especially during the discussion parts. Um, we can email Kenza at kmamuni at augusta.edu or C. Gillian Lopez at augusta.edu. I think that's the last of my slides. Um, and so, again, uh, if you have any technical questions, you can type them into the chat or you can email one of the others. Um, any questions about how we're going to conduct the session? Is there anything in the chat? I'm not seeing. No. Okay, good. You can see again, there's uh, Claudia's uh, dutifully suggest in the, in the chat that you can contact her if you have problems. So we'll move right into our educational presentation. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Harold Rabinovitz as our featured speaker today. He's part of our dermatology team here at Augusta University, and he also maintains a very busy private dermatology practice in Southern Florida. His talk today is about dermoscopy, and this presentation will last for about 20 minutes. We'll know we're getting close to the end of time because there will be a warning chime when there's about two minutes left. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Dr. Rabinowitz, um, you've already shared your screen. We're grateful for that. And if there are no further questions, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here today. I'll begin with an introduction to dermoscopy. So as relevant relationship in terms of disclaimers, I'm either a consultant or a, a clinical investigator for these various imaging companies. As you can see, these are all melanomas. It's not such an easy diagnosis to make because these are what are called shades of pink melanomas. And this is from a 1967 dermatology text. This is a melanoma and yet this classic text called this a junctional nevus, impossible. 1975, a senile lentigo, I don't think so. And it wasn't until 1985 that the NYU group of Friedman, Regal, and Koff published their classic paper where they commented on the features of early melanomas. And these included lesions which are asymmetrical, unlike benign pigmented lesions, which are generally round and symmetrical. Melanomas are asymmetrical. They're irregular. They're variegated in their color. And finally, they tend to be greater than six millimeters. And they coined this the ABCDs of melanoma. Asymmetry, can you cut the lesion in half? Is it a mirror image? Symmetrical benign, a nevus, asymmetric melanoma. Border regularity, is it well circumscribed or is it poorly circumscribed? Well circumscribed, a nevus, 
poorly circumscribed a melanoma. Color variegation. Is there one color or are there many colors? One color, a blue nevus. Many colors, a melanoma. In diameter greater than six millimeters, here we have this intradermal nevus, the so-called una nevus, less than six millimeters, here a melanoma. But there are pitfalls to this rule, as has been shown, that small diameter melanomas have comprised an increased proportion of melanomas over the past 25 years. Back from 1972 to 1982 at NYU, their comprehensive melanoma program, only 6% of their melanomas had a diameter of six millimeters or less. 10 years later, from the Sydney Melanoma Unit, approximately 31% of their melanomas were less than six millimeters, and the standard now is that about 30% of melanomas are less than six millimeters. And here are examples of small melanomas. In 2004, Abbasi suggested an e evolving lesion to include the five S's of size, shape, symptoms such as itching or tenderness, surface bleeding, and shades of color. Here we have such an example. This is a lesion here and you can see the dramatic change in terms of its size, shape, and surface over a period of six months. In two, uh, another suggestion was F or funny looking lesion. The suspect lesion appears different from other benign lesions seen in the same patient, the so-called ugly duckling sign. So here we have this lesion and you can see that all these other lesions are very small. These are what are called signature nevi. This is the outlier, the ugly duckling. And when we do dermoscopy, we see these great odds granules. This is a melanoma in situ on sun damaged skin. The Bologna sign, this refers to eccentric pigmentation in a lesion and a percent of pigmented lesions with the Bologna sign will be melanoma. And here you have three examples of the Bologna sign. All three of these are early melanomas. In our opinion, the color gray is an important color to the diagnosis of melanoma on sun damaged skin. We see here these very subtle nuances of gray. It's an important clue clinically. These are all early melanomas on sun damaged skin. And finally, subjective patient concerns. Jim Grichnik, who's chairman at the University of South Florida comments, I worry more about the lesion the patient points out as concerning, but it's unclear why the patient is so focused on that lesion when there are plenty of other moles to choose from. The point is, listen to your patient. And we have the clinical clue of facial melanoma. Almost all facial melanomas on sun damaged skin are isolated, flat neoplasms acquired during adulthood to a particular quadrant. So here we have a early melanoma, no other lesions on his face, an isolated lesion, an isolated lesion, and an isolated lesion. So when we see an isolated lesion, you must consider melanoma on sun damaged skin. Some feel they can diagnose melanomas. I still find it difficult after 40 years. And here's the reason why not all melanomas are the same. Melanomas have different genetic mutations. Some can be raised, some can be pink, some can be ulcerated. In fact, our accuracy is not very good just with our eye. In fact, it's about 65%, which is like going to Las Vegas to play blackjack. How good are skin cancer specialists at diagnosing melanoma on visual examination alone? Sensitivity, not great. Sensitivity of 70% and the specificity of 75%. And these skin cancer experts, for every melanoma they diagnose, they biopsy anywhere from 12 to 15 lesions. So it's important to realize it's not so easy to differentiate benign from malignant neoplasms of the skin as well. Here we have seborrheic keratoses, all benign growth, and yet they look like melanomas. Here we have basal cell carcinomas, which look like melanomas. And here we have melanomas that look like nevi. In fact, as I mentioned before, not good accuracy with our eye. So we certainly need devices to help us make the correct clinical diagnosis. When I was a resident, the standard gift was to get a magnifying lens. And I'll never forget when some of my 
uh, professor has gave me one of these magnifying lenses. And then they came in different sizes and shapes. You could put them on your head. And it wasn't until the advent of the dermatoscope, which we'll be talking about today, where we now were able to see features that were not previously discernible to the unaided eye. And this is a dermatoscope. It's a handheld microscope that provides detailed visualization of the structures of the epidermis, the dermal epidermal junction, and the papillary dermis. These are not visible to the unaided eye. And it's a powerful tool to help us diagnose melanoma and to differentiate benign, malignant, pigmented, and non-pigmented lesions of the skin. Normally when light hits the skin, it's either scattered, reflected, or absorbed. You can't see subsurface structures, but we do get a better visual acuity, and that's why it's very important when looking at the skin to have a good overhead light. Now, if we add alcohol or saline or oil, we apply it to the skin, we apply a dermatoscope to the skin, we can see structures underneath the surface. At the dermopidermal junction, we'll see lines and holes, and these lines correspond to melanocytes. At the DE junction, we see a different pattern. It consists of these round structures, and these round structures are called globules, which represent nests and melanocytes in the papillary dermis and the vasculature. Different neoplasms have different vascular patterns. Clinical dermoscopic. Big difference in terms of what you can see. And we also have fables in dermoscopy, the ugly duckling sign, as well as the beauty and the bee sign. And the ugly duckling sign is we look again for nevi, which look similar. We look for the outlier. And the outlier is this lesion. You can see it's different than all the other dermoscopy images. And this is a melanoma. And we have the beauty and the beast sign. And as dermoscopists and dermatologists, we like things that are pleasing to the eye. We look for symmetry of color and form. And when we see symmetry and color and we see organization, it doesn't bother us. We say, wow, this is really nice. Whereas lesions that are ugly lack symmetry of color and they give you this sense of unease. So we rely upon this innate aesthetic sense of what is beautiful to help it distinguish a nevus from a melanoma. And these are all the common benign patterns and they're organized and they're symmetrical. In contrast, the melanoma is the beast. And it also gives you this, this degree of asymmetry of pattern, color, and structure. And when we see this, we kind of stop and go, hmm, this really bothers me. And these are the beast, clinically and dermoscopically. And you can see they lack symmetry of pattern and they lack organization. Here we have a spectrum of melanocytic lesions, nevi, melanomas, and because with our eye, there are few features to distinguish this, there's this tremendous overlap of uncertain lesions. And these are lesions which we often biopsy. When in doubt, cut it out. With dermoscopy, it narrows that, but there's still an intrinsic limitation with dermoscopy, but it's certainly fewer. And we can now identify more nevi and melanomas based on dermoscopy. In fact, our accuracy is improved with dermoscopy over visual inspection by about 15 to 20%. How good are skin cancer specialists with dermoscopy? Higher sensitivities, higher specificities. For every melanoma, it's anywhere from four to seven nevi at our biopsy. Now, this was the first dermatoscope here in the United States. It was actually down at the University of Miami by one of my colleagues. It only cost $250,000. Not too many people were willing to buy this. So the big breakthrough came in the mid-90s with these handheld microscopes. And over the years, they've come in different sizes and shapes. And essentially there are two types, those which use non-polarized light and those which use polarized light. Now the non-polarized light is either contact with the skin as well as a liquid emerging, you need both. With polarized light, it can be either in a contact or non-contact mode. And here are some of the non-polarized dermatoscopes. For most applications, it's important to use alcohol. It helps reduce some of the scale in our older patients. And for nails, we like to use a gel. 
With polarizer mosquitry, it has additional filters, which cancels out light reflected off the surface of the stratum cornea. And with polarized dermoscopy, you're able to see deeper structures. However, sometimes it's at the expense of the superficial epidermal structures. And these are some of the older polarized dermatoscopes. Both non-polarized and polarized dermoscopy allow you to see these subcorneal structures by reducing the skin surface clear, although by way of different mechanisms. These types of dermatoscopes are not better than one another, rather they serve to complement each other. And there are differences between the two. With non-polarized dermoscopy, it requires contact with the skin as well as an immersion fluid. We like to use alcohol. And most of the images and textbooks are used taken uh, with these dermatoscopes. Well, in contrast with polarized dermoscopy, you know, it can be either in the contact or non-contact mode. There's no need for liquid immersion. And these are some of the newer devices. So let's take a look and see which structural colors are best visualized with contact non-polarized dermoscopy. The epidermal features of a severed keratosis, which you all know is a benign growth. We see this, I call this being a member of the 50s club, has specific dermoscopy features. We'll take a look at some of these. And this is one of the most important. These raised projected areas are called ridges. And these depressed areas that are brown are filled with keratin. And that's a classic severed keratosis dermoscopically. And when we look histologically, this raised portion here is the ridge, these raised projected areas, and the depressed area is filled with keratin or fissures. You have to realize with dermoscopy, you're looking down on the surface of the skin. So it's looking at it in a horizontal plane. Here with polarized dermoscopy, well, you see these ridges and fissures, but look how much better you see them in the non-polarized mode. Polarized, non-polarized, you can see the difference. Milialike cysts, these are these round white translucent structures. Histologically, they're characterized by these keratin filled cysts. Now with polarized dermoscopy, you can see them, it's these whitish structures. Look at the difference. Non-polarized dermoscopy, you see them Quite, care, uh, quite clearly. Another important feature are known as regression structures. These are gray dots, granules, or peppering. These are better seen with contact non-polarized dermoscopy. And it's an important feature seen in melanoma on sun damaged skin. And it's actually the most important. When I see gray dots, granules, melanoma on sun damaged skin goes into my differential. And this is what it looks like. It's called peppering these gray dots, granules or regression structures. Histologically, it corresponds to melanophages and fibrosis in the papillary dermis. So with polarized dermoscopy, here you can see the clinical and the dermoscopy with polarized dermoscopy, kind of see these gray dots, granules, but so much better in the non-polarized mode. You can see the difference, it's dramatic. A blue-white veil. This is better seen with contact non-polarized dermoscopy. And this is what we see with our thick melanomas. It's this diffuse blue with this superimposed white hazy appearance. This is called the blue-white veil. Histologically, it corresponds to a thickened epidermis superimposed over numerous atypical melanocytes. Now with polarized dermoscopy, you don't see, you see what are called white shiny structures, which we'll talk about in a minute. In the non-polarized mode, there is your blue white veil, polarized and non-polarized. Which structures are best visualized with polarized dermoscopy? The white shiny structures I just mentioned are better seen with polarized dermoscopy. And it's important feature seen in melanoma as opposed to nevi. In fact, less than 1% of nevi will show these white shiny structures. So if you have a white shiny structure in a melanocytic lesion, you have to think melanoma. These also can be seen in, not in benign and non-melanocytic neoplasms, but for melanocytic lesions, it's very, very important. So these are the white shiny structures, these white lines. And these white shiny structures have different patterns with melanomas. They tend to be in these form of these lines. Sometimes they're parallel, sometimes they're orthogonal, and they correspond to thickened collagen. 
So I showed you this picture before. This is the blue white veil in the non-polarized mode. This is the white shiny structures in the polarized mode. Vascular structures. Sometimes it's the only feature to help us make a diagnosis. These two are better seen with polarized dermoscopy, and particularly if there's no pigment. So this is classic for basal cell, these so-called serpentine or arborizing vessels. When I see this, this is basal cell carcinoma. And this is what's called confocal microscopy, just shows these linear vessels, these torturous vessels. And this is the corresponding vasculature, these slit-like spaces. These vessels here are called coiled vessels. And when we see coiled vessels, this is classic for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So I don't need to see clinical pictures, although please, it's very, very important. We need clinical pictures to help us correlate with dermoscopy. And this is with confocal and histology shows these vessels here high up in the papilla. Now with non-polarized dermoscopy, you can see the vasculature, but look at the difference with polarized dermoscopy. So vasculature, we look and focus using polarized dermoscopy. Here is a squamous cell carcinoma. Here is a squamous cell carcinoma with these coiled vessels with polarized dermoscopy. So it's important to realize that it's to best evaluate lesions, we like to use both. And here, is, these are what are called the hybrid scopes. They allow you to use either contact non-polarized or polarized light by actually just by pressing a button on the side of the device. And this has been called the blink sign, where you toggle back before polarized and non-polarized dermoscopy, and it, you're able to highlight specific structures because of the differences in depth of imaging. Now, this is a blue-white veil. It's a melanoma. It's the contact non-polarized mode. You flick the button. Now you see the white, shiny structures. And the reason for this is, is with non-polarized dermoscopy, you're looking at this thickened epidermis superimposed over pigment will give you this blue-white haze. In the polarized mode now, you're looking at the deeper structures. The collagen is altered, superimposed over pigment will give you white, shiny structures. Just a couple examples. Subtle lesion on the back. This could easily be over, overlooked. With the dermatoscope, though, you kind of scratch your head. You see over here, this is called an atypical network. There's some gray dots granules. You then use polarized dermoscopy, and you see the important feature of these white, shiny structures. This is melanoma. And here we see the histology. With this particular lesion on the back, it's an outlier. Dermoscopically, gray dots granules, regression structures, melanoma on sun damaged skin with contact non polarization. With polarization, you see the white shiny structure. You have your diagnosis, a melanoma. One final case subtle lesion. This is the lesion, this small little brownish discolored area of skin. And here we have what are called gray dots granules. Gray dots granules think melanoma for this small lesion. With polarized light now, we see the white shiny structures, a melanoma on sun damaged skin. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Are there any questions? Thanks a lot, Dr. Rubinovitz. That was tremendous. A lot of, a lot of uh, information there. Do we have any questions in the chat or does anyone care to raise their hand and ask a question? Okay. Um, as we prepare for the case discussion, um, I will introduce Dr. Kendall Buchanan. Uh, she is from the Augusta University Dermatology Department, and she's going to present today's question or today's case study for us. She'll have about 10 minutes to do the case presentation and about 10 minutes following that for the discussion. Uh, again, there'll be a warning chime for us if, if we get close to that time. Um, Dr. Buchanan, I uh, see so you've got your slides up, so we'll let you take it away. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Um, Kendall Buchanan, I'm here in Aiken, South Carolina at one of our satellite dermatology clinics. So thank you all for having me today. I'm really excited to run through this case with you guys. We can move on to the next slide. 
Okay, so this is a 60-year-old male. He had a family history of melanoma, and he presented to clinic with a changing pink lesion of the right back. So you can see the zoomed-in photo on the right. You know, this is a, a little bit of a, a challenge, right, to even wonder if you should get out your dermatoscope for this um, lesion. However, a little trick I like to use for pink lesions is the three R's, so red, rays, and recent change. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Okay, and so on dermoscopy, um, Dr. Rabinovitz's um, lecture was a great segue to this case. So what we're seeing on the left is under non-polarized dermoscopy. So the first thing that kind of catches the eye is, for me at least, is kind of several colors here. So you notice the white, you notice, you know, shades of pink or red, and you also have some scattered areas of brown. So the brown are sort of the globules, and you can see that the overall pattern of the lesion is slightly asymmetric. So the globules are distributed irregularly. You also have what we call a negative pigmented network. So where normally you would see reticulated brown lines, in this case, you see these at the lower portion of the image, you see these kind of white lines that sort of traverse through this lesion. You also see a little bit of peppering, which is the gray dots and granules. And then you can also start to sort of recognize some of these vascular structures that may look slightly abnormal. And then when you toggle to your contact polarized mode, this is when you start to see some things that just don't look quite right. So what we're looking at here is the shiny white structures, which as Dr. Rabinovitz mentioned, correspond to a, like a thickened collagen. And then you also see these polymorphous vessels, which in this case, we're seeing a couple of different types. You can see um, towards the lower half of the image, vessels that look like dots. And then kind of on the periphery, you're seeing more vessels that are kind of linear and random. So these are just two of the photos of this patient that were taken in clinic to kind of emphasize the dermoscopic features. Okay, next slide. So again, in this case, the, the polarized view is um, sort of the winning view for this patient because you can see clearly the abnormal vessels and also these shiny white structures. Now these vessels, you would also think about in a Spitz nevus, Spitzoid melanoma, and in this case, um, particularly think about a shade of pink melanoma. You can also see vessels as dots um, in other things like a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, um, psoriasis, um, porokeratosis. But in this case, you know, kind of the whole picture, abnormal colors, um, recent change, we're seeing white shiny structures and also these polymorphous vessels. So with that, you know, picture, and then the patient also with the family history of melanoma, we did recommend an excisional biopsy and this was performed with narrow margins. Okay, next slide. And the excision was um, conclusive with a thin invasive melanoma. So um, on the pathology, we see some uh, nesting of melanocytes. You have variable size and shape, and there's some confluence and bridging at the um, epidermal dermal junction. So non-invasive, but um, this would be consistent more with um, like a melanoma in situ type. Okay. And so, um, or actually that, that might've been more of a um, stage one, a re-excision was performed with one centimeter margin and they, we did not see any residual melanoma and the patient has been disease free for three years. Okay. So why did we choose this case? Um, again, 
I think shades of pink melanoma are particularly challenging, even for me as a dermatologist. Um, and I'm relatively sort of new to the intrinsic features of dermoscopy, but I think for me, just even recognizing that you should look at that pink lesion with your dermatoscope, um, because you know the the more training that you get and the more things you look at, it will become a lot easier to be able to at least differentiate between what's benign and what's malignant. Um, and sort of as, as we've referenced, like a seborrheic keratosis, something like that would be very easy or usually easier to tell with your dermatoscope. Um, and then in this case, you know, a particularly challenging vascular pattern along with the white shiny structures was a good case to review for a shade of pink melanoma. Um, and so kind of just answered that, but these are some questions that we have for the team. So what are the most important dermoscopy features to evaluate for in a shade of pink melanoma? Um, in this case, is polarized or non-polarized light more useful? And what type of biopsy to perform? That's all I have specific to this case. Um, so I will... I can mute my screen or if anyone has any questions, um, I would be happy to answer them. And if I can't, then I'm sure Dr. Rabinovitz can. <laughs> so thank you very much, Dr. Buchanan for that. So just kind of to summarize the cases that we have uh, a pink skin lesion that presents a challenge for any of us, obviously, um, even a skilled dermatologist and so being able to use a tool like a dermatoscope uh, to help differentiate this and then make a decision about what to do is kind of the best way I know how to shortly summarize the case. I do like the fact that you talked about uh, when you, your, your guide, your three R's, if it's raised, if it's red, and if it's showing recent changes, that raises your suspicion uh, for something that might be of, of some concern. Um, fair summary, Dr. Buchanan, of that? Yes, sir. That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, are there any questions uh, for Dr. Buchanan, or has anybody got anything to go back for Dr. Rabinovitz at this point? I don't see anything in the chat. I just I do want to ask uh, just for for my purposes the device that we're using as part of this project for for the uh, consultation service is the Moleskope. Um, can someone comment for me, please, on whether that is a polarizing or a non-polarizing device? The the Moleskope is actually a polarizing device. They actually do have Moleskopes which are both polarized and non-polarized. Uh, but for this project, it is polarized. Uh, polarized is often used actually when we're doing dermoscopy. Uh, in the we usually use the polarized mode because otherwise you have to put alcohol every single time on the lesions. Uh, polarized light also helps you to find the vasculature better, as well as the important feature of those white shiny structures. So for the project, we're using a polarized scope which is then on the iPhone. Terrific. Thanks for that explanation. That will help us understand, um, especially, you know, considering that we're dealing with uh, non-dermatologists, the idea of keeping it simple and getting the most information possible out of one application seems to be uh, critical here. Uh, are there comments from anyone else? Dr. Davis, did you have anything you'd like to share? Well, I would just say as a practicing dermatologist for 30 plus years, it used to be that I went a lot with my gut. So I would tell my residents if I found myself going back to a certain lesion and looking at it three different times, then my gut was telling me it has to come off, you know, and there is still a part of that. 
but the, the dermatoscope has just revolutionized the way that um, we're able to diagnose lesions and have much better comfort level with some of those when we decide not to do that a biopsy because, oh, it's clearly a seborrheic keratosis. My gut was maybe wrong that day. Um, but I think that um, it's clearly changed the way we practice and uh, really um, made things much more straightforward in many ways. I mean, I think when we biopsy things, as Dr. Rabinovitz has said, um, we're, we have a much better odds of it being something that needs to come off, so. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Would anyone else perhaps on the dermatologist team uh, perhaps just kind of break us break it down for us? Uh, I think in, in uh, some of the cases we talked specifically about a complete narrow margin excision, obviously for small lesions, and then sometimes we're dealing with larger lesions. And I don't know what the expertise is amongst our provider community, and maybe we can get some comments from them about what kinds of biopsies they're used to performing. Uh, I know one of the challenges that any busy primary care practice faces is you've got a full schedule trying to take time aside to do an excision or even uh, a simpler biopsy might create problems. But someone has some thoughts about, you know, um, ex, you know, narrow margin excision versus other options for biopsy. I think one of the other options we have is what we call deep saucerization especially uh, when you have a busy clinic, it will be hard, you know, getting a few millimeter margins and excising that. In that case, we could do deep saucerization when you will bend the blade and you just take a deeper margin with a shave. So that's one of the other options we have, I believe. That's great. So deep saucerization is basically taking the blade and turning it into a spoon shape and scooping out a piece. That's right, yes, sir. So the, the, the two most important biopsies we do either are excisional biopsies or these deep shave biopsies. And the reason we do them, particularly for melanocytic lesions, it's important for the pathologist. In order for him to make the correct diagnosis, he needs to see the entire architectural pattern. Now, if it's a very large lesion, obviously you're not gonna be able to do a broad shave biopsy, so taking a good portion of it that is doing an incisional biopsy sometimes is an alternative. Punch biopsies are really not the best way to go for melanocytic lesion unless you can have the entire neoplasm within that, within that punch biopsy. So you have a, if you have a six or seven millimeter punch biopsy and get around the lesion, it's the same as doing an excisional biopsy. Uh, and that's when we use the punch biopsy, uh, and it does save time. That's great. Well, we're getting kind of close to our time here, and I guess sort of the key question that um, I hope that we've answered today is uh, how do I best utilize the dermoscope or the molescope in this case to access expert opinions to uh, determine wh whether to biopsy, not to biopsy, or refer, and I think um, for all of us in the project right now, we're still a little early in our own experience about how best to use this. But I think we've been given some great information today on how to at least understand how dermoscopy works, how the molescope may help us to uh, identify lesions that are of concern, obtain an expert opinion, and then with that guidance, make a thoughtful decision about biopsy, not biopsy, or refer because we may not be able to perform the biopsy. Does that seem like a, a reasonable uh, summary? And did, did we get close to answering that question? Comments from any of the participants? Yeah, so Dr. Wally, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, you've been sending cases now for a couple months. Uh, what is your experience? Can you hear me? We Just can. want to test it out. For Great. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you first for having this. Um, I've had the phone um, with the Moleskope um, for, I guess, a few, at least a few months now, uh, more than a few months. But um, the, the ease of using the 
um, software inside the phone, connecting the phone to the mole scope is, is very user friendly. Um, I'm not, you know, an IT person myself. Um, you know, I um, just kind of give myself background. I know we're trying to um, break this down for primary care folks from like myself who try and just to grasp this and work inside of a busy clinic. That is super key. And I really appreciate those comments. Um, but the uh, using the Moleskope um, and uh, having obviously Dr. Rabinovitz um, chime in on, you know, what I need to do with this. Um, it has, uh, you know, been great for my patients, especially um, in my practice where I have lots of um, patients who don't have insurance or don't have good insurance. And um, I will say this, uh, you know, I have had, um, and Dr. Minimus uh, knows that, you know, I've had people who have been diagnosed with some cancers already and have I've given referrals to dermatology and they've subsequently had excisions and uh, Mohs procedures and um, it's been taken care of thanks to y'all um, but um, I, I think uh, you know it's it's an amazing thing it can definitely work um, you know my it coming from a practice where you know I I, I haven't had time and carved out or you know, my, my thought process isn't, you know, to get to the skin right away. Um, it is hard to, you know, put that into my practice. And um, I am trying to make that an intention, um, even with the students that I do have here to help maybe augment it. Um, but uh, I, I think that it, it, it brings, um, you know, these discrete or these, you know, hidden lesions that could be malignant out into the open and it it, it uh, can definitely help our communities that would you know would otherwise be forgotten um, and many lesions looked over so uh, that's that's my take on it I'm I'm loving it it's making me more, more comfortable just having this one session you know to grab that scope and um, you know learn from it thank you Sam that's great. That's, that's all great. So I think um, it's about time to wrap things up. Just a couple, couple announcements. Um, thank you, Dr. Patton, for leading us through the presentations and the discussions. And thank you to Dr. Rabinovitz and Buchanan for the presentations. Um, and to all of you who have offered comments. The, for those of you who want CME or CNE credit, um, Claudio, should have the uh, CME, CNE code in the chat and please register for your credit as soon as possible. Moving forward, we will need volunteers to present case studies for future sessions. Uh, so if anyone has a particular case they'd like to bring up, please let us know. Uh, in general, we'll probably try and do two case studies per session. Today we began with a lot about Project ECHO, um, but that's sort of a one-time thing. Uh, every so often we will be asking you to fill out a brief survey so we can get feedback and comments about these sessions. Um, but please, at any time, let us know how ways that we can improve the sessions or, um, and in particular, any special topics that you would like covered in the didactic uh, parts of the sessions. So our next session will be May 2nd at 4 p.m. We are generally trying to meet on the first Monday of the month. Dr. Rabinovitz will talk about dermoscopy terminology. And again, anyone uh, who would like to present a case, let us know, um, or we may be volunteering you and asking you to provide um, a case. So thank you everyone for attending. We will see you at our next session. And a reminder to our Telederm uh, hub people uh, to stay on for a uh, post-session briefing. And people from the uh, Spoke Clinics can now sign off. Thanks for being here and have a good week. Thanks everyone.
Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, I think I think we're the hub. Uh, comments on on today's session. How did it go? How did great? Uh, great, great job okay. to both the presenters. Yes, fantastic. Are there yeah. uh, any issues? How is the sound coming from the hub? <laughs> it was everything great. was good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to hear. Anything? Any suggestions for the future? For the uh, we didn't. We didn't hear the um, timer. The timer. Oh, okay. All right. We will make yeah. more oh, of that. Well, Talita, Talita heard it. I didn't. Okay. I guess. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Please. Can we, can, can we can the timer? I promise I will never go over twenty minutes. <laughs> 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 You did great. I think I ran over. So. Great. It doesn't good. matter. It really doesn't matter whether you're a minute, two minutes before or after. No. And I can tell you, when you give a lecture and see that timer goes off, it gives a little bit of panic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. But, <laughs> we're all mad at this. So. Oh, my adrenaline is good. It's yeah, awesome. right. <laughs> anyway, just to see you. a race. OK, well, thanks. Um, all right, I think um, we realized that for our regular Teleder meeting, which um, would be normally next week is, um, but that's a, there's a conflict with the AACR meeting. Uh, so um, that's not a good day to do it. And um, so Dr. Cortez and I talked and we think we will dispense with a regularly scheduled um, Teleder team meeting for the month of April. And, uh, but I'll send out email um, updates on things. But we got for today. Great job. Yeah, Yay. congratulations. Yay. Awesome job. Very nice. A lot of work and a lot of stress went into this. Thank you very much to those who coordinated these.